super excited listening to Dr. Larson talk in this room before me was fantastic. I couldn't have handpicked a uh, better person to go after, really. She had me all jazzed up. I was over here in the corner. I was like, yes, yes, yes. Talk more. Um, but it's hard sometimes to find people that can really appreciate the impact that ocular motor and neurovisual perception can either subtract or add to your, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, can subtract or add to your recovery and your rehabilitation. So I'm going to talk a little bit on the type of therapies that we do as functional neurologists um, that are receptor based for non neurotypical children. So this includes traumatic brain injury, noxic brain injury, CP, HIV, ASD, ADHD, um, dyslexia. We see, we see them all. Um, but where I'm at, we don't really treat this diagnosis. We just look at the brain. When they come in on Monday, we give them it's like two and a half hours of diagnostic testing and physical examination to figure out what parts of the brain don't work well and what parts do. And that kind of ties in with what I talked about this morning. So we'll go ahead and get started. There you go. The neuro necessities. So what does our brain need to survive and to be healthy for it to have that optimal function? And that's really fuel and stimulation. So when you break it down, fuel is super broad, um, but what we really need is oxygen and glucose. So When we're looking at fuel, why do we need oxygen and glucose? We need it to have our cells produce ATP. ATP is our cellular energy production. So for that, what can we do to promote better fuel, which will then help with our receptor therapies, receptor-based therapies? Healthy diets. You know, I'm not a nutritionist, but I'm board eligible to be a fellow on the American Board of Neurochemistry and Nutrition. So I look at food maybe a little differently than others. I'm looking at it as how can we get the building blocks we need for our neurotransmitters to have the best brain function possible. So you're looking at eating healthy fats, fatty acids, omega-3s are amazing. Um, if you want to know more about that, feel free to shoot me some questions. I'm a big proponent for pediatric brain injuries to have um, omega-3 fatty acids high in DHA, because that's our neuroprotective fatty acid. EPA is excellent too. It's anti-inflammatory, excellent for adults, but I love the DHA with kids. Um, having good proteins, having good amino acids, having your trace minerals, plenty of water, and then your B vitamins as well. And if you can't get it with your diet, which I think can be really hard sometimes, especially with YouTube, that's why we have supplements. And it's actually a really cool company out here today talking about um, real food for kids with YouTube. So I think it's amazing. It's exactly what we need. Um, give them everything. Give them all the building blocks. I think it's crazy sometimes in hospitals how lacking their cafeteria food could be if they're trying to help people heal. You know, with, um, with Apophrates and Wendy's quote, basically, that look, could be that medicine. It's something this person, I apologize. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. I get it. I kind of know what I'm talking about sometimes. So, <laughs> so other things that we need for fuel oxygen. Another big company out there with oxygen. I love how fitting everything was. But even if you don't do H5, you need good oxygen. So, different ways you can do that is proper breathing mechanics. You can have chiropractic care or um, osteopathy care to help with your rib movement and thoracic, um, thoracic lumbar curve so that when you're breathing, you're getting good diaphragmatic excursion and really filling up those lungs. So oxygen, hyperbaric is great, but you can do other ways too just to make sure your daily oxygen flow is what you need to really give your neurons the fuel they need in form of oxygen. And then stimulation, and this is where we, co we come in. We do have h pop units at my clinic, but it's a, it's a stimulation that, that is why the, the kids are here with us. So the way we think about it, we have the bottom-up sensory stimulation, so all the information your body is giving your brain. And our brain needs that to turn into electricity to function and survive. So all of our senses will give us what we need to turn that energy into the electricity that our neurons use to fire and communicate and create new bonds. And then we have sensory receptors. So what do we have in common with a battery, a uh, solar panel, and a microphone? It's kind of super abstract. 
Um, but we all take a form of matter and energy and turn it into electricity. So that is called transduction, or that uh, transducer is something that turns energy into electricity. So I always, even before I you know, started doing anything like transducer, it sounds so mechanical, you know, like robots have, I don't know. But it's like, no, humans have millions of tiny little transducers that are turning energy into the electricity we need to have our neurons function. And that's why it was so cool. You know, who would have thought that we have something in, in relation with the solar panel? Um, but we do. And so then when we break it down a little further, what are our neurological receptors? So the big ones that you'll hear a lot about are our five senses. Sight, sound, taste, hearing, touch. When you break, that, break those down even further, you really can sum them up into just three. You have chemical receptors, photic receptors, and mechanical receptors. So chemical is where you get taste and scent. Photic is where you get vision. Um, and the mechanical is where you're going to get touch, proprioception, but then also sound. Um, sound is the mechanical vibration of your eardrum and then with the inner workings of the ear as well. So we're going to include sound with mechanical. Alright, so olfaction. And I'm just going to switch up how my computer is showing these just so I can be a little more efficient. One moment.
So that's how we use the folding receptors to really give us what, what we need in terms of cortical stimulation. A completely different way we can use light, though, to help our patients is by photobiomodulation. So this has been really huge just in the last probably two years. Um, if you heard me talk this morning, I have like a little neuro crush on Dr. Deutsch. So he talks about light therapy in chapter four of his second book, uh, The Brain That Heals Itself, The Brain That Heals Healing. And basically, it goes all the way back hundreds of years ago where they found that if they would take the little jaundice babies into the sunlight, that there, there wouldn't be a yellow skin, that their jaundice would improve. And that was really the basis behind everything with how light, we need light to help us heal, have things function properly. People know they need sunlight and help with your vitamin D and things like that. But there's even something different. Um, the last couple of years we found in research that you have little receptors in your cells that can use photons to create energy. And this is so exciting because that means we can use light to stimulate a specific part of the brain that can tell that part of the brain to produce more energy and ask for more blood flow. So increasing cerebral blood flow, increasing ATP output. So we can use a handheld devices like this, like this little cup. Okay, like the, like, like the, the one with the brain. So they're just handheld and I can put it, what I want, right there, that alone. If I'm trying to do, like hit the brain stem for that, that base of the pyramid, I have an attachment that I can go through the mouth and I can hit towards the back of the mouth because if you were to like, dissect the cadaver, it's right behind the mouth where your brain stem is, like two inches. So I'm at right, <laughs> right in the center there. So we can do intranasal, intraoral, transcranial. Um, if you want something a little more global because the injury is diffuse, uh, this is my patient, Alex. He's hilarious. Um, before he came in, actually, he had a bit of a sour disposition. Um, his mom said he cried every day since his injury. His injury happened at birth, which uh, for seven years, he just cried every day. Um, and he came with us the first time, and he had his first smile. And then he came back four months later, and he had his first laugh. And his mom was crying. She's like, this is the most peaceful day I've had in my life in seven years. And while it's not just due to the fall by modulation, it, it's, it's everything that we've been doing and they've been doing at home because they work their butts off with PT, OT, um, and everything else. Just knowing that when you have an injury that affects your whole brain, that while it's good to have specifics for the weaknesses, if the whole brain is in, in general, has some loss of integrity, it's really good to have that whole brain asking for more blood and to create more energy so we can really improve and and enhance what we're doing with our other therapies. So almost every patient will get some sort of photobiomodulation. Alex here has his little cap on, his prefrontal cortex, uh, parietal and posterior parietal cortex, which is where our spatial orientation centers are. And then the intranasal. Um, intranasal is pretty cool. Depending on what bone you have in your school, a lot of the leg is blocked out. But the thinnest bone is your sphenoid, and that's the bone that's behind your nose. So if we can go through the nose, we can kind of get rid of some of the interference that we have with the different cranial bones. So that's why we have a little thing in his nose too. Um, it does him well. Right. So that was folate receptors. Let's go to mechanoreceptors. And this is the, the pinnacle of physical therapy, is using mechanoreception to really drive um, brain integrity and uh, neurorehabilitation. So the reason with the guitar up there, a lot of what we do is going to stretch our muscles. And kind of like if your guitar string is super tight, it makes, you know, it gets a stronger signal, if you will. So we'll stretch certain muscles to make that muscle and those muscle spindles give more input and stimulation to the brain. So there's different ways you can do that. Um, I would feel bad if I didn't mention chiropractic. I need to get a doctor in it. So chiropractic is a great way to do it. We've got a reception, you can improve muscle tone, mobility, um, decrease pain is what a lot of chiropractors use this for. Um, but kind of like you can have doctors specialize in different things, or chiropractors specialize in different things as well. Um, and then the breathing mechanics, like we talked about earlier. So even though I am a chiropractor, I don't adjust super frequently, I really, you know, I really love my neurology. If you can't tell, it's definitely a passion. 
But if my patient needs an adjustment, most likely I'm going to adjust the ribs so they can get better oxygen, so the neurons have better fuel, so they'll be more responsive to the therapies I'm about to give them. So chiropractic care is very, very good for mechanoreception and improving those breathing mechanics. You can also have somato sensation. So this is where vibration therapy comes in. This is where some of the school of thoughts with brushing can come in as well. And then we also use SSCPs, uh, which are somatosensory book potentials, which is electricity used to activate the nerves to go up to the brain and activate the air of the brain that those nerves um, are either from or they have a connection there. So we'll use our, our little units, um, the two prongs, although we have some more prongs too, but um, on different points. So I just read a really good research paper recently about doing median nerve stimulation on people that have wake them up from comas because the median nerve synapses with your, um, the, the part of your brain that helps give you consciousness. But we use that with people that are conscious anyways, because we can ask that area of the brain that gives you alertness and focus and, and concentration and consciousness to ask for more blood flow, and it does improve cerebral blood flow in that area. And then we'll do it along the face as well. So I know you'll, if you look at our, some of our social media, you'll see people that have it on their tongue or their eyebrow. Um, and the reason we have those areas is because, kind of like I mentioned earlier today, and I can talk to you, some of you about it, um, out by our group, is the face and the tongue is really rich because our cranial nerves are what give it sensation, feeling, and taste, and touch. So for our face, you can do it on your tongue. You can actually hit those cranial nerves that live in your brainstem. Um, your brainstem is where all the autonomic function lives, where those nucleus live. So we can do that amount of sensation using electricity on several different points on the body, face, and even the tongue. Vestibular therapy. So some people might not recognize what this picture is. That's okay. Um, that's our mark. So where I work, we have the only mark in the world. And mark stands for multi-axis rotational chair. So you'll see a bunch of, not a bunch, but there's more chairs out there that can spin in one or two planes. So you can have the three planes of movement are, are Yaw, like a ballerina, um, pitch, like a somersault, and then roll, like a cartwheel. Each of those are represented, though, in our inner ears and our vestibular system because we have three semicircular canals on each side of our brain that are actually carved out of our bone. Um, and that's something that even in the fossils, they've seen these semicircular canals in the dinosaurs. So we've had this vestibular system for millions of years. We just need to make sure it works well so we have a good foundational level, like we talked about. Um, this morning. So vestibular therapy can be anything from small head movements to sitting in a swivel chair to having those kids that are in the little uh, the, um, swings where they wrap them and they spin around and around. Um, that always makes me a little, little sick looking at them, but it, it, the kids love it. But then we also have the marks too. So we can have a full body rotational therapy for maximal vestibular therapy. So we use the mark for that. Um, and the mark is unique because it has all three planes and you can yoke or combine any of those planes you want. So depending on what you have going on in your brain or your child's brain, they might go forward and to the left, or they might do one front flip followed by one front flip. We might go fast on one plane and slow on another depending on what we're trying to change um, and what areas of weaknesses we're trying to build up. So for our receptors, you can see we have our three white color pieces, chemical, photic, and mechanical. But then that fourth blue color piece is kind of like, what's going on there, right? The most important thing to take away from this is while we have all these receptors, what's really going to make the biggest difference in the neuro rehab of your children is knowing when to use them, how to use them, and how to combine them. Um, so that's where it really comes into play um, when you have a, a professional that knows what they're doing in that regard to know if, if blue is good for one thing but it's bad for this part of the brain, is it worth it? You know, can, we, can we have the pros and cons? If they, need, if they need to activate a certain area of the brain but it's so fragile that the moment you activate it they have a seizure, maybe that's an area of the brain we do full biomodulation on first. Warm it up, if you will, get the energy there, and then we do a different therapy on top of it. 
Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can combine it, but that's why it's always good to have, have a center that has everything all there with you, so you, you can combine it in the area that you need to. Um, I think I mentioned it earlier today, I'm just going to talk to one of you guys about it. Um, your brain doesn't learn one thing at a time. So a lot of times you'll get these brain injuries and you'll get prescribed 12 weeks of this good. And then, you know, 16 weeks of vision. And then maybe you get PT twice a week for five weeks. But your brain doesn't just get vestibular stimulation and then just get visual stimulation and then just get physical therapy and mechanical receptor stimulation. When you're learning and developing, you need it all at once. So one of our philosophies is that if you're going to rehab these systems, give them all of it over the same, you know, hour or two hours so that they have everything incorporating and synergizing well, so we can have that optimal function. So something that kind of ties in that um, is the next slide. So we've been talking all about down up. So sensory stimulation, how the body is affecting our brain. Let's talk about top down, so more cognitive stimulation. And this is one of those things too, it's more at the top of the pyramid that I talked about this morning. So once we have all those layers and foundations really strong, let's rehabilitation procedures. So one thing is timing. So I was mentioning like being able to play patty cake and having those coordinated movements, having it in time to a beat just adds another layer to it. So something that we have in our plan is called the interactive metronome. It has you see something, which is kind of like a game, which definitely makes our kids more, more <laughs> interacting with, with what they're doing and a little more excited. And one of the games, like it's a little, like a little uh, alien, and then if you clap right on the beat, that alien turns green and smiles. So I tell them you're shooting them with a the friendship gun mm -hmm. because they're happy afterwards. So if they clap in time to the beat with what they hear and what they see, and they can coordinate that in the same time with what they're doing, you can get that top-down stimulation as well. Um, it's a bit advanced, but it's, it works really well. And this is what I'll do more so with our children that are on the spectrum or have ASD. Because sometimes they have these areas that are functioning so well, but they're not they're not regulated, they're not controlled. They don't have good timing of them or good grasp of them. So as they go to do something, they could be good at it, but they're not good at incorporating it with other things. You know, they move a lot, but are they purposeful? Are they are they coordinated in their movements? And can we get their their brain to kind of give their bodies better control? Another thing that we do is hand eye coordination. Um, this is this is Dr. Larson amazing. She was talking about this too, and I was like, yes, more. So we do a lot of hand coordination activities at uh, plasticity as one of our receptor-based therapies. So this is great. You're incorporating the visual system, visual motor reaction speed, and then a motor response. So kind of like we talked about this morning. You have to interpret, receive, or perceive, interpret, and then respond. Um, something that's great and that I use a lot with children with anoxic brain injury. So we have a little boy that had a near drowning event um, when he was two. And he's five now, and I've seen him basically every four to six months since the accident. And at first, we were just trying to get, right, the bottom of the pyramid, autonomics. Um, there's reflexes in there, you can get some visual reflexes. So once that started going on, you put it in a dark room, light up our D2 board, which has all those red dots on it, and we would move his hands forward. So a dot would light up, I would turn his head, his mom would have him touch the dot. So kind of creating a very passive visual molar response. Um, but we've been working up that pyramid and we just got to the point where I put, who motivates him? His favorite thing is pumpkin bread from Starbucks, so I try to bribe. It's not the healthiest, I apologize, but I try to bribe him. His mom says, okay, she gave me permission. Um, but we'll put a little, a little snack right over that red dot when it lights up, and then he'll reach for it, and then he'll put it in his mouth so that he can start getting used to feeding himself. Um, we just had his G2 removed this year, and now we want him to be able to feed himself to start with that, you know, give him some semblance of, of independence. So the hand-eye coordination can be very advanced, but it can be very simple too. We can really use it for a lot of different types of, of neurological deficits. And then we even have a D2 that's different, it's called a neurosensory integrator, where all the dots move on you. So then you have to track them as well. So that's like another another layer added 
you know, at the level of our of our pyramid to make it even more complex. So we have cognitive training. So this can be, once again, there's a very wide um, range, a very large spectrum of different cognitive training that we can do. Um, I work with a lot of kids, but occasionally I work with adults as well, with people with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, and I want to work on their memory and spatial orientation. Um, there's a really cool research study recently that showed um, using a 3D platform video game, like Mario, was a good way to improve some of the older population's spatial memory awareness. Um, so you don't have to go buy a lead or anything crazy like that, but we do different cognitive training um, as top of the pyramid. And there are different games. I always go working with kids that you can gamify your therapy. Kind of times easier. Um, so we'll do different games with them to practice that inhibition or to work on, you know, the top of the pyramid things. And we even have different language like, games too. And sometimes it's not about the game. I don't care if they get a good score. I'm watching their eyes when they're doing it, seeing if their eyes are smooth, if they're having good jumps. I'm measuring how long can I get their focus. Um, so will you please take cognitive training to the very end? of our treatment because by that point I've warmed up kind of the base of the pyramid from the bottom up and now we can we can spend a little time at the top of the pyramid too with that behavior and cognitive training. Okay. I have a video and I'm gonna see if it works because this morning my other video did not. Can you try to push play up there? <laughs> sure. Neurologists and chiropractic neurologists that they basically they speak their lingo, 
which is great. So I'll, they, they, they they know what we're talking about. And sometimes we like even with Dr. Larissa and today because she is in her world with with vision therapy and optometry and making sure that the the foundation of your neurological developmental pyramid is solid and really really strong. Um, so in terms of what can you do in Mountain Florida. You can find a functional neurologist in your area. You can always give us an email. Shoot us an email. We can find someone that, that we trust that's closer to you. Um, there's not a ton of functional neurologists in the world, but our network's growing daily, or yearly, I guess, probably a better way to go about it. So we can, we can find someone near you to do the evaluation, and then if, if those therapies there can get your kid better, awesome. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I, don't, I, I know there's, there's a cost associated with traveling out of state for it, but if you need us, we're, we're here for you too. Um, there's a hop, skip, and a jump away. You know, if your airport is nearby. Does so that answer your question? Any other questions? You can, but we don't recommend it. So, because of how intense our therapies are on day five, adult, child, anywhere in between. You are so fatigued that we recommend a break, go home, do your thing, go to your other therapies. Because we also know that when you're traveling, you're not, you don't have your physical therapist with you. Usually, um, but usually you're you're sacrificing to be here. So give us that week, go back home, and then maybe a couple months later you can come back to us for another week. Um, there have been people, especially our, our Europeans, that fly in. They'll come for two weeks. But we know that ahead of time, and we tailor their treatment so that they don't fatigue out on us on that first Friday, right? So that we, we kind of go a little, a little bit low and slower of burn so we can get all through those two weeks. So we can do it, but yeah, our typical stays, just that three times a day for five days. And then following that, we might recommend you come back. You know, 80% of our patients don't come back, but 80% of our patients are in concussions. So if it happens, you know, if you're fully development, like uh, your development was fully complete and then you have an injury and it just set you back and then you can just set you back forward, uh, it tends to be a little quicker recovery than, than children that have something that occurred earlier on in life where we, you know, it's, like I kind of say before, it's more of a marathon than a sprint. So with that marathon might come, you know, coming back to us in four months or six months or maybe just once a year. And then all my, um, our lead clinician, Dr. Antonucci, one of his sons has autism, and every summer before school starts, he goes to brain camp. And even though he's pretty high functioning, he just goes to brain camp to make sure that he's as good as he can get before he goes to school and really to give him the best edge he can have um, before he starts the new school year. So he's been doing that every year, and his kid is nine. And then he had, he had autism, and then he had a school fracture. Um, he was two, so then that kind of compiled everything. So he's an identical twin, his identical twin has autism, but not, not as severely as he does. So, um, yeah, there's always a chance we can see each other again after, after the video looks good to go. Awesome, all right, I'm gonna let you guys watch a little video. Dr. Hence, 
uh, philosophy of the neurons that fire together wire together. So if you can get different areas of your brain to fire simultaneously, you can get them to work better together in the future. And that's where a lot of sensory entrainment or doing different things at the same time can work out for you. Um, we also talk about how if you make a cake and you throw your eggs in your flour and try to stir that together and then add baking soda and salt and then maybe butter at the end, you're going to have a terrible cake. Um, so with any recipe, there comes a quantity and a sequencing. And that's where we really come in to know how much does each patient need of each therapy, but then when do they need it. And that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, where if they're seizure prone, we're going to do certain things first before we go attacking that, that visual system. You know, knowing that that might be an area of weakness for them. We're going to build it up in different areas before we go after it. Uh, for my kids with ASD that I see, it's, I know they need that movement, I know they're craving it, I see them, you know, getting their, their self-stimulation behaviors. First thing they do when they walk in the clinic, pop them right out of the line. Give them the strongest vestibular therapy they can get, test to calm down, and then we can move forward with our other therapies and give them more direct and specific sensory stimulation in the areas that they need. You know, for some of the people that have mild cognitive impairment, I might pop them in and do, do that the whole cap light and just increase how much their brain is demanding from their body and then move forward. So it's all about creating that recipe and knowing that that recipe changes person to person because every person's brain is different. Um, you know, like we're so accepting that fingerprints are different person to person, but then we have these protocols that people use sometimes for brain rehab. And if it worked for one kid, it worked for one kid. And we can take clinical jumps from that, but we shouldn't be, you know, copy pasting that, you know, all day long. So that's where we really like to make sure the recipe is unique to that person. Oh, they're making a cake. So just proper order, correct amounts to produce the desired outcome. And that's that's what receptor-based therapies are, are all about. Knowing which receptors to hit, when to hit it, and how much to hit it. Um, and make sure that our, our stimulation is specific and Specific, not just on where it's, where it's being um, given, but also to that patient to make sure that it's exactly what they need. And then being able to be open to adaptations if the result is is not what you thought it was going to be, or if they progress to have the care plan and treatment progress with them. So that's that's your separate based therapy. Yeah, question? So is the evaluation separate from the practice? No, it's the same. So Monday's our discovery day, that we call it, um, and you come in an hour and a half diagnostics, an hour physical examination, and an hour long treatment. And during that treatment, there's going to be a staff clinician like myself with you all, the whole time, making sure that, all right, uh, the your pupils fatigue when I was giving them different electrical stimulation. You know, maybe I do 15 seconds for one, maybe it's seven for another, but having someone watch their eyes, see if they're getting that metabolic fatigue that we're looking for. You know, maybe we do something and they're like, I need to get tired. I joke that if you're not tired at the end of the day, I need to do my job. So I want to make sure my patients are pushed. You know, push that envelope, not off the table, but it, until it wobbles. And then once it wobbles, then we pull back a little bit. So yeah, the Monday is the evaluation, and then based on your genetic responses, which occur, you have an early genetic response every two hours, and then a delayed genetic response every 48 hours. I do treatments every two hours. I do evaluations every 48 hours. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, you have, it's called an early immediate gene response. I know like the acronym in my head, I just spelled that a little bit. Um, and then it occurs every two hours which means that whatever therapy you do, you're not going to see the progress from it or you're not going to express that genetic potential from that until you hit another two hours. If you have a delayed immediate gene response, it's something like counterintuitive. They're both immediate, but in the grand scheme of things. So the delayed immediate gene response occurs every 48 hours. So that's where if you're going to see a difference, like in their, in their physical examination tests or in their diagnostics, you know, if I, if I made you feel better and then I retested you, your tests are probably going to change one hour later. So that's why on we do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning, we re, re examine you. And on, on Wednesday, we try not to waste too much time. So I'm like, people in treatments is where you get better. 
So we'll just, I'll just look at the top 10 things that I feel I want to see improve and see if we have improvements there. If we do, we keep going. Um, and if we have either more or less, I might change up the treatment plan based on that. All right, well, I thank you for your time. And I appreciate being allowed to speak twice today. <laughs> If you have any more questions or want to know more information about what we do or how we do it, feel free to find me at our booth. All right, I want to thank you here. Thank you so much, everyone. Exciting.